Who doesn't like to receive good news? Hands up. We all do, don't we? We all love good news. I don't know what your favourite news channel is, but (coughs) do you get much on there? Do you get much good news? There isn't much, is there? Not an awful lot. It tends to be fairly insignificant things, pretty small things, but a lot of not good news out there. And maybe in your own lives as well. Maybe you get catch up with news with family every now and again, with Skype or whatever you use. Maybe old letters, I don't know. And sometimes it's good news and sometimes it's not, isn't it? But we love good news. Well, hopefully you've seen in that reading that Elite just read that we have good news here in the Bible. We have good news in the Gospel. That's what the word Gospel means. Good news. Something to rejoice at. And so we're going to hear good news from this passage as we look at it together this morning. This beautiful little passage actually, to my reckoning, finishes off, rounds off the main body of the letter to the Romans. The main body of the letter began right back in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, Jew and Gentile. And from that point, he goes right through the gospel, all the way through the good news and its implications for us from chapter 12 onwards. And so he's really finishing that here. And once we get to verse 14 onwards, he's he's speaking uh, in a slightly different way to to his readers. And, uh, and, And practicalities start to come into the letter. And so this is really the end of the main body, this this great sweep of the gospel from right back from. Uh, chapter 1, to here. And this rounds it all off. And so Paul here does so just by giving us good news, which is wonderful. Things to rejoice at. And so I hope, whether you've come in this morning with all your things weighing you down, I don't know, circumstances weighing you down, that you go on your way rejoicing, because that's what this is about. Good news this morning. So there are three aspects of good news, three bits of good news, if you like, that we're going to see as we go through this passage. First of all, the first bit of good news is that the Gentiles are being included. The Gentiles are being included. Just see how many times this passage mentions Gentiles. Six times, I reckon. Twice in verse 9, then verse 10, verse 11, twice in verse 12. And verse 10 seems to sort of summarise the tone of the message to the Gentiles. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. That's one of four quotations from the Old Testament, from all different parts of the Old Testament. That's a quotation from uh, the Old Testament there in verse 10. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And so that sets the tone. It's rejoicing for us Gentiles. Now, I don't suppose that you think of yourself too often as a Gentile. Now, I'm rather assuming that you are. There may be some people who are actually Jews here this morning. That's fine, but... Certainly nationally we are Gentiles and most of us probably individually are Gentiles as well. Is that how you, if that's the case, sort of technically as it were, is that how you actually think of yourself? Probably, I doubt it, probably you think of yourself as British or something like that or maybe European, depending on how you voted a few weeks ago. British, European, maybe Southern, or, you know, a sort of down south person, I don't know. More to the point, you probably think of your people group, your, your nation, our nation, as central. We do, don't we? We think of, I think we, we think of British as you know, the middle of a map. You know, if you go down a map of the world, there we are, Britain in the middle, where it ought to be. You sort of think, yes, yeah, all is well. And if you sort of went to America and saw America in the middle of the map, you think, well, something's a bit skewy here, isn't it? And of course, we've got the advantages of the meridian line going right through our capital, and you can go... And, go to Greenwich and stand with your foot either side of the centre of the world, our country. We defined zero, didn't we? There it is, right in the middle, slap bang. And so we think of ourselves as pretty central, don't we? If you asked a Chinese person, though, whether they thought they lived way out in the Far East, they'd go, no, we live in central country. That's what China means. I don't know if you've ever seen the Chinese characters for China. It's, It's two characters, and the, th- the first character is a square with a line right down the middle, telling us that they think their country is the middle of the world. Uh, they don't know, do they? But 
Well, actually, we're both wrong. That's what this is telling us. We're both Gentiles. And Gentiles are sort of outsiders, you know, sort of somewhere from out in the sticks. We're not central at all. We're not sort of the middle of the world. So America, all sorts of countries think of ourselves as the middle of the world, but we're all wrong. The fact is we're all out in the sticks. We're, we're all out there somewhere. It's the Jews who've been the central people group in God's eyes. Not for anything special they did. No. It's all by God's sovereign grace and his sovereign choosing of them. And it was to Abraham and Isaac and Israel, uh, Abraham, yeah, Isaac and Israel, that, uh, that God directed his attention and made his promises and, and, and set his love on them. We Gentiles, which we certainly are nationally, as I say, even if probably most of us are also individually Gentiles, we Gentiles are far out in the sticks, out in the wilds, as it were, when it comes to God's way of reckoning the history of the world. But, verse 9, God has shown mercy to us Gentiles. He's given us reason for for what it says in verse 10, to rejoice, O Gentiles. He's shown mercy to us. Now, it's only when we realise that we are not the middle of the earth, whoever we are, that we'll get the full force of this. And it's only when we realise that we're utter outsiders that we'll get the full impact. We'll realise God has been merciful to us, completely off the radar, us Gentiles. So as I say, right back at the beginning of this main body of the letter, chapter 1, verse 16, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek or Gentile. And we have something similar here in verses 8 and 9. Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that's Jews, to show God's truthfulness, in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So for the Jews first, and also for the Gentiles, to receive mercy. Jesus here, when he was on earth, he said that he came for the lost sheep of Israel. That's who he came for. And he, and he would actually f- say, tell his disciples not to go to the Gentiles in Matthew chapter 10. But then in John chapter 10, he says, yes, there will be other sheep too for whom he's come. The Gentiles. But we're not central. We're not central. We're out there in the sticks. Now, we may find this a bit sort of, oh, I didn't come to be church this morning to be told that we're not the middle of the world, you know. But the gospel needs to disturb us, actually, before it settles us. It always has to do that. It always does that. The gospel always disturbs before it comforts. I mean, most obviously, it convicts us of our sin before it reassures us of justification by faith in Christ. It sort of always pulls the rug before it sets us up. It slays before it gives us life. As William Tyndale said, God is no patcher. He doesn't just patch us up. No. He brings us down and slays us. And so we Gentiles, it's like that for us as well. We're just out there. We're just off, off off the edge of the margins, as it were. Nothing special. Remote barbarians in terms of world history as God tells it. But we're remote barbarians to whom God has shown mercy and made us overflow with joy. Now I'm not saying that we Gentiles are second class citizens in God's kingdom. Definitely not. And those that have been through baptism classes with us recently will know that we've been looking at this from Acts chapters 10 and 11. The Gentiles come on exactly the same footing as the Jews do. And and baptism is is a sort of uh, sign of that, that everyone gets to use the front door, as it were. No, but we are nonetheless outsiders who've been brought in. Wild branches that have been grafted into the cultivated tree. Or or think of the late invitees to the banquet in uh, Luke chapter 14. In fact, just turn there with me to Luke chapter 14, because this puts it... Really rather nicely. Luke chapter 14. I'll start at verse 16. And this is Jesus speaking. He said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. 
And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who'd been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I need need to go and examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. So we Gentiles are here described as the the people invited late in the day from the highways and the hedges. That's where we've been brought from, the highways and hedges, been brought into the banquet from there. Not very flattering, is it? But actually, if you think about it, this actually increases our reason for rejoicing. Because we're nothing, you see, we're, we're just nothing. But God has brought us in and made us full members of his household. Full members. Fully adopted sons and daughters. Children of God. It's not that we Gentiles were an afterthought. No, if you look at God's promises, the nations were always in God's plan. But we were nonetheless way out, far off as Ephesians chapter 2 says. Now brought fully in. And so that's our first bit of good news this morning. We've been brought in. God's mercy has extended way out to us here on the Sussex coast. And so we meet week by week to glorify God for reaching out to us. The second thing I want to look at with you this morning, the second bit of good news, is that Christ is actively bringing Gentiles to flock to him. Now, this is similar to what we've just looked at in in my first point, but it's more. It ratchets it up at a level. My first point is about the fact that Gentiles, us outsiders, have been uh, brought in. We've been uh, allowed, as it were. We've we've been invited in. But this point is about the fact that the Gentiles are actually being brought in. In great numbers. By the power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Look at me with back in Romans chapter 15. Look at verse 12. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. Now that's quoting Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. And the little phrase, the root of Jesse, means the Messiah or Christ. It's the same thing in different languages. The Messiah, the Christ, is the the saviour king that God promised in the Old Testament and God promised that the saviour would come from the family line of King David in the Old Testament. And Jesse was David's father, so that's what the reference to Jesse is. So this is talking about the Messiah. Now in an idle moment this afternoon you might want to possibly think about what the phrase root of Jesse means because this isn't saying it's quite the same thing as offspring of Jesse, which of course Christ was. This is saying the root of Jesse, which is something rather bigger, isn't it? But I'll leave that for you to think about another time. I don't want to dwell on that because I want us to get the main point of verse 12. What's the main point of verse 12? What's verse 12 saying? Well, Isaiah prophesied in that verse verse quoted here that the root of Jesse, the Messiah, the Christ, would arise to rule the Gentiles and because of that, the Gentiles will hope in him. Not will be able to, not will be welcome to, yes, that's our first point, that's true, but more than that, will actually hope in him. You see, the risen Lord Jesus Christ reigns on the highest throne as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we sort of know that. We sort of know he's exalted above every name. Philippians 2 and all those verses. He sits at the right hand of God. But that's not as though he's so far above us that he's got nothing to do with us. No, he actively, from there, rules down here, rules this world. 
Rules the Gentiles, rules us, rules the UK, rules Poland, rules Moldova, rules whatever country you choose to name. He rules from his glorious throne down here. And he rules in power. He's he's a monarch, not like our um, our monarchs in our country nowadays. Nowadays, the Queen and, and so on whatever monarch we have, is a constitutional monarch. They they don't have actual power. That queen has been a brilliant monarch in so many ways. She's served so well. But actually she has very little power. In, in, In some ways, in fact, she has even less power than we do. For example, you know, we're allowed to publicize uh, what we think of on various issues. The queen can't. She wouldn't be allowed to. She can't say what, which way she would vote in the referendum. We can. We've actually got more power than our monarch in some ways. Christ is not like that. He rules in actual power. And in his power, he, what's he doing? He's bringing the Gentiles to hope in him, verse 12. They will hope in him. And in fact, I would even go so far as to say as they will flock to him. The Gentiles flocked. Now, why do I say that? Well, I think the context of where that Isaiah quotation comes from in the Old Testament warrants me saying that the Gentiles will flock to him. The previous verse in in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9, says this. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's what it means for the Gentiles to come and put their hope in the Messiah. Just note the, sh- the sheer scale of what that involves. Just go and look at the seafront. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you're going to do that this afternoon. Go look at the seafront and just see. I mean, just look at it and just, it just spreads everywhere, isn't it? It just covers everything. So that's the first bit of context in Isaiah that sort of it may, it lets us indicate that that actually it's going to be huge numbers of Gentiles that the risen Lord Jesus Christ is actively going to bring to him. And flock, flocking to him seems to convey that idea quite well. There's another bit of context back in Isaiah as well which seems to indicate large-scale numbers of Gentiles turning to the Messiah. And that's from Isaiah chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. And there there's a wonderful prophecy of the Gentiles flowing or streaming to the mountain of the Lord. Now, have you ever seen a small number of people flow? No. Flowing implies vast crowds. Maybe you see people flow when they, I don't know, when there's a, a barrier, there's a huge crowd and a barrier, and the barrier's removed, and they start to just flow out of that. And you see it from a great height. And it literally looks like liquid flowing. That's the idea that's going on here. And it implies, again, vast Numbers. And so the context of our, of our quotation from Isaiah, our context within Isaiah, gives these two impressive water images to prophesy that the Gentiles are going to come to the Messiah in large numbers. And I reckon the phrase flocking to him sort of puts it in a nutshell quite well. The global knowledge and praise and seeking of the Lord. That's what the Messiah, the Messiah has come and arisen to power to bring about. That's what this quotation is saying. He has arisen to power to bring about that very thing. As a result of his rise to sovereign power at God's right hand, the nations will flow to him, flock to him, and the earth will be covered with, with the, the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Now that is a magnificent prospect, isn't it? But it's not one we see, is it? We, we look out and we sort of see all the blue chairs as I stand here. And I don't see much flocking as I look out at the doors. So what's going on here? Why don't we see people flocking to Christ at present in the West? How do we square that with what verse 12 seems to indicate from the context in Isaiah, as I've been saying? Well, I think we square it like this. It means that the current dearth of people turning to Christ is a blip. It's an aberration. It's an abnormality. It's bizarre. And it can't last long. People confessing, coming and confessing their sin, falling at the feet of Christ, 
putting their trust in him, seeking his ways, having their lives permanently changed, that's the norm. That's the way it is, because Christ is on the throne, making it happen. Now that's a great encouragement for us to know, that that's the norm, isn't it? And that has happened at numerous, many points in our nation's history. It is happening nowadays in many parts of the world, China, South America, Middle East, all sorts of places. That's the norm. Our experience at the moment is not. We can easily think that our barren experience is the norm, and so we get downhearted and disillusioned, don't we? No, Christ has arisen to power. In him the Gentiles will hope. He's not arisen powerless and feeble, but with glory and sovereignty and authority to make it happen. He's not trying his best. He's achieving his intentions. Bringing people into glad submission to him. Flocking to him for salvation. Even if that's not what we see, that's what's happening elsewhere in the world. And that, this says, is the norm. Now how would this affect our lives if we really grasped it? This is surely good news, isn't it? Good news that this is the reality of what is the norm of what Christ is doing at the moment as he rules from God's right hand. How would this affect our lives if we got hold of this and really took it on board? Well, I think surely it would give us a robust confidence in the advance of Christ's kingdom, the building of the church. A robust confidence to to live for Christ and to speak about him in our different situations that we find ourselves in Monday to Friday. Surely it should fuel our prayers too. It should shape our prayers. Think of the Lord's Prayer. God's, may your kingdom come. If if what I've been saying is true, that Christ has arisen to make it happen, that the nations will flow to him, then just think how that would affect how you pray, your kingdom come. You'll pray it with a greater confidence, a greater urgency, a greater desire to see it here and now. What has been happening at other times and at other places. It certainly is good news, isn't it? Something for us to meditate on, take comfort from, pray expectantly for. I need to take that on board as much as anyone. Well, the third thing I want to look at briefly this morning, the third bit of good news from our passage, is that the God of hope wants to fill us. And here I'm looking at the very last verse that we read. Verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So this verse brings the main body of the the letter to the Romans to close on a wonderful note, doesn't it, of hope. And this hope is not some if and a maybe, not some, well, it might happen, it might not, depends. No. This is the certain future that God has prepared and has already established through Christ's coming 2,000 years ago. It's a certain future for those who love and trust Christ, a certain future. And in, across the letter we can see that this hope is described as, chapter 8, verse 24, the redemption of our bodies, our resurrection that's talking about, the, the hope of the glory of God, chapter 5, verse 2. So it's, it's about that, that future day of salvation on the day of Christ, when he appears to judge on his throne. And it's about resurrection to a life of glory from that point on in in the renewed creation. And so this is the future that God has given to those who love and trust Jesus Christ. We don't yet see it, but we're to wait for it patiently. That's what chapter 8, verse 25 says. It's a, a hope not yet seen, but we trust and believe it is the reality that will come. And while we wait... The God of hope wants us to be filled, verse 13, with all joy and peace. He wants us to be filled with all joy and peace and to abound in hope. You see those filling, abounding sorts of words. And that's just while we're waiting. So God wants us to be filled with joy and peace in this waiting period until Christ appears in glory. And then there's the consummation of all that he's planned for his people in Christ. And we can't really 
fully grasp what that will be. So God surely has good things for us if we trust the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's you, if you trust Jesus Christ, God has good things for you. You have a certain hope, a hope of resurrection, a hope of salvation on the terrifying day of the Lord, a hope of comfort on that day, being saved, of being rescued and being taken through to the the world that's to come. Now, if you've never experienced the sorts of things that this verse 13 is talking about, this, this, this hope, this certain hope, this joy and this peace, well, you need to know how you can come to have this for yourself. And the answer is in the very verse itself. It's in verse 13. How do you have these things for yourself? Two things. By believing and by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is how we come to have this hope and joy and peace for ourselves. What's the believing talking about? That's talking about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died and rose again. So that all who trust in him can stand before God without guilt, without condemnation. He can stand forgiven, reconciled, adopted, brought in, welcomed, embraced forever, held on to and taken to glory in the future. All by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, the verse also says that it happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot save ourselves. We can only be saved by the power of God grasping us and saving us by the power of the Spirit, convicting us of sin and uniting us to Christ. So there is good news in this passage. Good news for Gentiles like us, who have been brought from the outside, from the hedges and the highways, been brought in, into God's household, if we love Jesus Christ. There's good news that Christ is on the throne, making this happen by his resurrection power, by his sovereignty. He is doing this in large numbers, bringing people to himself in glad submission, gladly laying their broken lives at his feet and finding salvation and healing and wholeness and a hope and a future in him. And there is joy and peace for the, all those that do so. So if you've never experienced this joy and peace, if, if you don't know what this is talking about yourself, come and speak to me afterwards, but also just see what it says in verse 13. It's by believing in Jesus Christ, and it's by the power of God's Spirit working in you. That's the only way you can know this hope and joy and peace for yourself. But if God is working by his Spirit in you, you will believe, you will be drawn to Christ. And for many of us, that has already happened. We know Christ. We have this joy and peace where God wants to fill you well, more and more while you wait for everything that he has planned for his people. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for the good news of this passage. We thank you for all the good news that has come to us through Jesus Christ. Thank you that there is salvation. Salvation from our sins in which we we would otherwise stand utterly condemned before you. Thank you that you take our guilt away through the death of Christ. And that we stand justified in his resurrection life and vindication and power. Thank you that there is a hope of glory to come. Thank you that you've welcomed us in from the outside. We we were not the middle of the world. We were not the centre of the universe. We were outside, way out, in the highways and hedges, but you've brought us in. Thank you that Christ is on his throne, making it happen, drawing the Gentiles to himself, so that they flock to him for salvation and lay their lives gladly at his feet. May we each, each here today, have that and know that for ourselves and be filled with joy and peace and go on our way home this morning filled with joy at the good news of the gospel, the good news of all that Christ has done for us, all that we have to look forward to. So fill us with this joy and peace, we pray. Amen.